But uh, there we go. All right, Psalm 98. You guys didn't think that was as funny as I did. That's, that's fine. Um, <laughs> Presbyterian jokes, it's fine, it's fine. Psalm 98, we begin a new series. Well, a new series. We're taking a break from Ephesians for the uh, Christmas season, and um, we're going to use uh, a number of songs. Uh, we, one of the, the, the most, I would say, it's nostalgic, but I do think most of the things that are nostalgic to us have significant meaning, uh, and that is the songs of Christmas that we sing in church. O come, all ye faithful, hark the herald angels sing, silent night, away in a manger. These are the type of songs that we, they come up every single year. And so sometimes beginning around Thanksgiving, for some of you sometime in you know, October, you begin listening to Christmas carols, and it is the, the song and the background of your life. And so we're going to use a number of carols this, this uh, December as a means of, of driving us towards Advent, as, of reminding us and preparing our hearts and reminding us of the beauty of the incarnation, the, the fact that Jesus took on flesh. So we're going to use four carols over the coming weeks, and we begin this morning with the song Joy to the, to the World. But Joy to the World is um, written by Isaac Watts. He is one of the most prolific hymn writers uh, in, in, of, of modern hymnody. He... Uh, was frankly annoyed with the hymns he was singing at his church. And so one day when he was late in his teenage years, looked at his father and was complaining about the fact that how boring the songs they were that they sang in church. And so his father did what many fathers do for teenage sons who get kind of uppity. He looked at him and says, well, let's see if you can do better. And Isaac Watts said, okay. And he took it, he took it on the task and spent really the rest of his life. He, he, so over 600 known hymns are written by Isaac Watts. And one of the particular books that he ultimately published is he went back to all the Psalms and decided that he wanted to try to put the Psalter into to modern language and in particular rewrite the Psalms and rethink and respond to each of the Psalms, there's 150 of them, in a way that, can, that reflects on Jesus' first coming. The fact that the Psalms look forward to the first advent and yet we in the New Testament age live in the second, looking forward to the second advent. And so he published 138 of the 150 psalms. He wrote poems reflecting upon the psalms. And the psalm that ultimately, the poem that he wrote that became joy to the world was Psalm 98. And so while we want to, we will kind of talk in general about oh, joy to the, the song, joy to the world, the, the, all the psalms we're going to be looking at in this series are rooted in some specific passage of scripture. And so that is where we'll give our focus. So Psalm 98 is where we're going to be this morning. We heard it to some degree, a little bit of this. Asher actually read a portion of it for us in the Advent reading. Hear God's word. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. So make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and all those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge, and he will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. This ends the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. May the grass wither and the flower fade, but may the word of our God, may it stand forever. Well, if you, um, just in case you didn't hear it, and, um, and repeat in that psalm and in the song, Joy to the World, the call of Psalm 98 and the ultimate call of, of joy to the world is for all of us to stand up, all of creation, all the nations, to, ulti- to join in and sing praises to our great God and King. To sing joyfully in worship to the Lord. The song joy to the world, that's what's the call. Joy to the world. Everyone bring your song of praise and worship experience joy, know joy, communicate your joy back to God. Joy, joy, joy. 
Trevor Longman, who is an Old Testament scholar, notes that the believer, it's not just the believer who sings here. It begins with the believer singing, and then it moves to all the peoples of all the nations, and then it moves to all the animals and all the, the natural world, everything. It's a rising of worship and rejoicing that the whole, all of creation, from God's image bearers to animals and to the sea and to the trees, cannot contain their joy, and they rise up to sing praise and worship to God the King. Now, singing and singing with joy is not something that you can simply make up. You can fake it, you can put a happy face on it, but it is hard to actually rejoice if you don't have joy. You see, the call here to rejoice and to have joy is a call to feel something. That's something that we don't necessarily, we think, oh, we just, we're just Christian life, we're just going to think our way into everything. But the call here, the obedience here, is that you are to feel rightly about God. Joy is an emotion. And emotions are things that cannot be conjured up or pasted on in order to be real. You know, I have done some significant social assessments about our church and about the world's some deep research, hours and hours of scouring material, and I have concluded something that you may have missed about this year. People are not happy with the year 2020. (laughs) They are are somewhat displeased with how this year has gone. You you may have missed this, this broad societal opinion. You may not be as learned as wise as I am uh, to notice this. But I actually, I, sadly, I sense it in church people as much as anybody else. We are an angry, agitated people. We are distressed. We have lost capacity. We are not doing the things that we used to be able to do. And it's interesting for me to look even around our church, and it is my sense, and my read pastorally could be wrong on us, but it's interesting, the pandemic in regards to bringing real suffering into the life of people in this church has been fairly minimal. I don't want to downplay where some of you have experienced suffering, but did you know that the jobless rate in Carroll County is lower than it was before the pandemic? That many of the things that we here see talked about around our country and around the things that have brought significant suffering, that actually isn't here. So what's wrong with us? I think a lot of things are wrong with us. In fact, if you want to show up later on, I'd be happy to tell you a few things that are wrong about you, and you can tell me a few things that are wrong about me. But I think there's some subtle things. We are disoriented. We are disoriented. Money might still be coming in, but the future is cloudy. We're confused. We don't know how we're supposed to respond to this thing. We we are a people who love progress. We're Americans, gosh darn it. And we can't progress. We can't be around other people. We can't live like we want. But it is more than that. We are a worried people. The pandemic, the cultural upheaval that has gone on, it feels as if it has conjured up within us some significant angst. And, you know, we... We're frustrated by the racial and the political upheaval around us. We're concerned about where things are going financially, and we don't have our normal joys to go to. We can't have the normal things that we kind of look to to kind of help us distract us from the frustrations of the things out there. And because of that, in many ways, I think we've lost our nerve. We, our stomach for many things of life and ministry we simply don't have. And what's the phrase du jour in the health world? It's we, we don't have good gut health. Spiritually speaking, we, 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 there's something that has us churning inside, and therefore we are a church that feels heavy, feels worn thin. We are irritable, angry, self-absorbed, feeling rather icky, worn thin. And if, we, if you're really with it, you'd say we've simply just lost our capacity for doing life. And here's how I know, because for the most part, people at our church have been willing to come to church, but where we are, we've lost it is we have no momentum in doing anything outside of coming to church Surviving with my family, and that's it. Service, ministry, progress moving forward, and we, we've lost creativity. There just seems to be a sense of going, you know what, we're just going to try to hunker down and grin and bear this thing for a while. And that is not the sign of a church and a city and a Christian world life that is living in joy and health. So what do we need? You see, joy is an emotion that, again, like I said before, cannot be conjured up but it is produced by another word that we use a lot around Christmas, and that is hope. See, the reason why we, we, I think why we're so confused and we're so unsettled and 
is because tomorrow feels really clouded. All of our, our, our normal societal activities and our, our expectation, we've, the delusion that tomorrow was coming has popped. And all the things that, the worldly things that we look to, they kind of brought us some security, have, it's shaken the ground underneath us. And so it's left us kind of wondering what's going on. But if we're actually to experience a joy that energizes us in the ministry, it can't be conjured up, but it is something that can be developed by resting in, by meditating upon what is our coming hope. And so to, we want to filter away the junk and the questions and the, the things that are confusing and try to see some light going forward. And so we go back to the psalm. Where do we find hope in this psalm? Where does it end? You know, it's an interesting place where we're supposed to find joy, the joy of hope. It's in a place you probably would normally think of it. This is our theme, have joy. But where do we find joy? Where, why does it say the rocks and the trees and the rivers and the seas clap their hands? Why? What is, how does it end? Because judgment is coming. Welcome to church. Joy, joy, joy. The theme of our morning is just joy in judgments. Joy comes by reflecting on the hope of a coming judgment. Now, this is rather antithetical, is it not? You say, wait, wait a second. Judgment, judgment, that's, that's no bueno. Judgment, bad. Love, mercy, grace, that's very good. Judgment, bad. The Bible has some pretty nasty descriptions about God's judgment, right? Fire, brimstone, I mean, it's, it's no fun. I mean, you never go to a worship service and hear an Advent reading on hell and judgment, do you? It's not like, you know, we just... We just want to bring the children up as a part of our nativity scene this year. We're going to have little eight-year-olds read about the coming fires of hell. Now, listen, that, that is not exactly how we get into the quote-unquote Christmas spirit. And yet, that seems to be what leads to the writing of joy to the world. And it's what ultimately leads to be the means, the thing that all of creation responds to that gives them joy. And so in order to understand this, in order to drive down to the hope of a coming judgment, we have to make some considerations. And so walk me with me through this. Here's your first consideration. It is the promise of a coming judgment in the second advent. Advent means coming. What we celebrate at Christmas is the first coming of Jesus. But as, as Christians who live after the first coming of Jesus, always at Christmas it is a reflection not simply on the first coming of Jesus, but always on the second coming of Jesus as well. In fact, joy to the world, and it's the original poem, what Isaac Watts is reflecting on is not the first coming of Christ, it is not necessarily meant to be a Christmas song. It is meant to be a second Advent song. The picture is a of a coming king. And what kind of king? A rightful and good king who will come, as it says in verse 9, to judge with equity and righteousness and goodness. And here is the good news of a king who comes to judge. He will come to make all unrighteous things and unjust things right again. You see, we tend to think there's two ways in which we can understand going into a courtroom. The way we tend to think about it is that we go into a courtroom in a criminal case, and you're the criminal, and God is the judge. But there is another way in which we can think about it is a civil case where you enter into the court as a plaintiff saying, someone has wronged me, and I need a good judge who will come and make it right. And that's the image that we get in Psalm 98. But this is vindication. This is when all those who have wronged me are put right. They get the justice that they deserved. And when Jesus comes, this is what happens in the second advent. When the judge comes, he will dry every tear because all the terrible things that are done to the weak and the impoverished in this world, all the horrendous injustices that are done will be made right. It says he will bind up the wounds he will set every bone. He will untie every treachery. He will reverse every effect of being deserted by awful husbands and parents who have left their roles to leave you to fend yourself. Every disease will be sponged away. Every cruelty will be dissolved into nothingness. The fatherlessness that so many of you have known and that so many in our city known will be replaced with a relationship with an everlasting father. And all the pieces of the glorious story of all the confusion suddenly will see it as right. We'll see on the other side of the tapestry. 
And this is where this will be the remainder of our life for all of eternity. When the king comes, that's what it's going to look like. And that is actually what judgment is for. And you know what? If you lived in some place other than America, you would probably appreciate this more. Now, I've used this illustration many times or this quote many times. But there is a, a thinker. I, I spent a year of my life right out of college in a, in a, in a country called Bosnia in a city called Sarajevo. And Bosnia in the early 90s was part of the former Yugoslavian breakup in which significant and horrific genocide was committed in that country. And there was a theologian who was raised up in Croatia, one of the other countries or states in former Yugoslavia. And he became a Christian pacifist in part because of what the horrific travesties he saw during the war. And in trying to defend Christian pacifism, he actually, what he says is, if you're going to be a Christian pacifist, you have to believe in a God who will bring judgment. And he says this. I've been to places where people have had their mothers and daughters raped and their fathers and brothers' throats slits, slits and their homes burned to the ground. And if I look at them in the eye and say, you just need to love your enemies, there's never going to be a judgment day because God's simply a God of love. That There's never going to be a day in which everything is going to be put right. We don't believe in that. But you just need to not retaliate. You need to live at peace. They're going to say, there's no judgment day? Oh, in that case, then I'm going to take up a gun or a sword, and I'm going to go get my retribution. In other words, what he's saying is, in the all of us, in our longing, is a longing for judgment day. A longing where we look at life in the, in the true terms of the horrific realities that are done and say, man, if we don't have a judgment day, then I'm taking judgment into my own hands. We long for a judgment day when things will be right. Judgment is necessary for the deliverance of others. There was another theologian who was, a, again, another Christian pacifist. He was a professor, but he confessed that there was a time when he was happy to, to hear the machines of war. He, this particular professor who later on became this Christian pacifist said that he loved the sound of the humming of American and British bombers as they flew over his home country of the Netherlands on their way into bombing Germany. Why? Because he was under the captivity of the Nazis. And the sound of the coming destruction for the Germans meant freedom and life for him. And this is what comes when a good king comes. Right? And you know, this is the stories of our Western fables, isn't it? Our Anglo-Saxon fables. Think about Robin Hood. Robin Hood is a fairy tale in which he's fighting until the good king, the true king, King Richard, comes back and what? Puts everything right. What's the other fable? King Arthur. On King Arthur's fabled or mythical tombstone, it says what, supposedly? Here lies Arthur, the once and future king. The once and future king. He was here, and he did everything that was great and right and good, and he is gone, but we believe he's coming back again. Why do, we so, why do so many of these fables exist like this? And myths exist like this. It's because innately there's something inside of us that we, when we look at the world and we see the injustice and all the badness out there, we sense, we, sense, we sense that it's bad because we have a longing for something that is better. Because we believe innately that there is a brightness and a justice and a beauty and a goodness that ought to exist. And frankly, I think perhaps God in our image bearing and in the history of the world has put something deep in our memory bank deep in the, yes, the brokenness of our image bearing, that that remembers that at one time we lived under a good king. That in the garden, before sin entered the world, before we rejected the king's rule and ran from him, how was things? All of creation worshipped the Lord. All lived in harmony. All lived in a beautiful world. And therefore, we know that if the king comes back and rules the earth as he once did, that things will finally be beautiful the way they were meant to be. The promise of judgment. All right, that's the easy soil. That's the easy soil. I mean, right, that's easy soil. We've come up with myths and fables. You don't have to be a Christian, believe, and hope for some promised king judgment the way I've just described it here. But we have to go deeper to get to the real hope and the joy. Here, there's the problem. There's a problem that enters in, right? The problem of the coming judgment in the second advent. Because if the king comes... He comes as a judge. You know, the best lines to me in the whole song of Joy to the World are, as far as the curse is found. As far as the curse is found. You know, the curse is not mentioned specifically in Psalm 98, but it is assumed. It is lurking. It is in the shadow of the psalm. 
In other words, the curse of the Old Testament is, is rests over as a shadow over all of the Old Testament passages. Because the idea of a curse is found deep in the story of the Bible. At the very beginning of the story of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, Genesis is the first book of the Bible, and the first two chapters, it talks about how God made the world, and he was the king of the world, and his people walked with him, and things were right and good. And then in chapter 3 is where sin enters the world. And what is God's response when he comes to Adam and Eve? He says, I've made a covenant with you that if you ate of the tree, I would bring death. And he describes that death as a curse. That he comes and he brings a curse upon the evil one who tempted Adam and Eve. And his curse goes to specifically to Adam and to Eve. That Eve will have pain in childbirth. And Adam will have pain and sorrow and suffering because now the ground will not produce the fruit that he longs for it to produce. But instead he will be, the ground will be hard. It will be infested with thorns. There will be disease. And so you won't be able to progress And be as fruitful as you once were because of things like sickness. It has entered the world. And in fact, the curse doesn't simply just go to humanity. It goes to all creation. In other words, the curse is found everywhere. Therefore, when it says that God, we want God's redemption to come, it means that we want God's redemption to come not simply in a spiritual way to our hearts, but to every part of the world. But not only do we find the idea of cursing in early Genesis that we live as a people, as a cursed people in a cursed world. But the Bible also shows us that the type of relationship that God has is a binding relationship. And when God comes to the people of Israel and he says, listen, okay, it's a cursed world, but I'm going to try to wedge out for myself a people that I'm going to call my own, and they're going to be different, and I'm going to bring my blessing upon them. And so I'm going to give them my relationship with me. I'm going to begin to restore the world to this people. But when he goes to make a covenant relationship with them, he does so in this relationship always with covenant blessings and covenant cursings. In other words, he comes and gives Israel the Ten Commandments and says, if you keep these, I will be with you forever. If you keep these... It will go well with you, right? The first, the first commandment, kids, honor your father and mother so that you may live a great and long life and so that it might go well with you, a blessing. But he also puts cursings in there. Let me give you an example to see if I, you can see this directly from the scriptures. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 6, shows us God's blessings. He said this, And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all that his commandments that I command you to do today, The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all of these blessings shall come upon you, and they will overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Do you hear the places of blessing? All the places that God cursed, the fields, your family. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, womb giving birth, and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds and your young of your flock. Blessed shall be the basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be you when you come in and when you go out. Blessings, blessings, blessings everywhere if you keep my commandments. And then Deuteronomy, further on down the chapter, here's the cursings. But if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you to do today, then all these curses shall come upon you and they will overtake you. Curse shall you be in the city, and curse shall you be in the city. You get the point? It's the same places. Your basket and your kneading bowl, the fruit of your womb, all of these places shall be cursed. In other words, if you go your own way, if you disobey God, not only will he not be willing to forgive you, but he will bring his cursings down upon you. It is, and so what we see here is in the scriptures, in the Hebrew scriptures, the shadow of the curse is everywhere. You live your life going, I hope I get blessings if I obey God, but if I don't, uh-oh. He's going to curse me. And so here lies the problem, and here lies the oddity for us. How can we rejoice about judgment when we know that we are covenant breakers? Have you kept the Ten Commandments? Have you honored your father and mother perfectly? Have you served the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength? The problem when the king comes, he comes back as a judge. And what are judges supposed to do? They're supposed to make all wrong things right for everyone. For everyone and in everyone's life. He's not simply going to respond to the sins of the few really evil people, but to the sins and injustices that you and I 
have inflicted upon others. Therefore, the entire Hebrew scriptures have this tension that they're building in. How can God say to us, he will never leave us or forsake us, and then we obey him, and yet then him be just? If he never leaves us or forsakes us, if he keeps his love and affection upon us, and we disobey him, uh uh-oh, he's going to destroy us. How can he both love us and yet be just to bring his justice to bear upon our sins? The king is coming, yay. He's coming in grace. That's awesome. Oh, and truth, oh, crud. Oh, crud. Because he's going to tell the truth about my life. He's going to tell the truth about my life. How can he give me unmerited favor of graciousness and yet be truthful about my life? So we have a problem in our reflection, don't we? If we're trying to dive down deep into the, the, the reservoir of hope where we can find, the, where joy can rise back up, we've hit bedrock. We've hit a problem. And therefore, we have to bring out the heavy machines with our third consideration. It's called the machine of the gospel. And that's the provision for judgment, not in the second advent. Well, it will be there for the second advent, but coming in the first advent. This song is ultimately about the second advent, but why do we sing it at Christmas? Because there is no good news about the second coming of a king coming to judge if we don't have the first advent. Jesus coming back is not good news unless he came the first time. And unless he achieved what he said he achieved. Look at Psalm 98. It ends with rejoicing about the future judgment with the arrival of the king. But Psalm 98 begins in verses 1 through 3 by looking to the past And what God has done. Here, we haven't read it in a little while, so let's read it again. Psalm 98, verses 1 through 3. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Why? For he has done, past tense, marvelous things. His right hand and his only arm have worked, past tense, salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed the righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the household of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Verses 1 through theory are saying that the reason we can look forward to judgment day and the second coming is because God has already worked his salvation in the past. Now, understand this. If we're going to bring this, the full illusions of the Old Testament into our understanding of Jesus, we have to understand the context of Psalm 98. Psalm 98 is written before Jesus comes. So what's the salvation that they're pointing back to? The, The mimicking of Psalm 98 is of another song. It's called the Song of Miriam. And it's sung on the other side of the Red Sea. After Israel has been set free from slavery to Egypt, and God has brought them through the Red Sea, and they chant together the Song of Miriam. And all of the illusions are the same exact thing we see in Psalm 98. And by the way, let me also mention this. There's another song that's going to come later. It's called the Magnificat. It's the same words. Miriam sings it. The psalmist sings it, and Mary will ultimately will respond to the angel's pronunciation that a king is coming by singing Psalm 98 and singing the song of Miriam because she knows her Bible as a 14-year-old. So you should know your Bible well. You see, what is it that Psalm 98 is, is pointing to? God's past salvation, but God's past salvation of deliverance always has come in the context of judgment. How is Israel set free from Egypt? God sends plague after plague after plague against those who enslaved them. And then he comes to them, and the ultimate thing that sets Israel free is the plague, the tenth plague. And so all of Israel, after they get on the other side of the Red Sea, celebrate for all the rest of their history this thing called Passover. Because when God says in the tenth plague, I am coming down on Egypt... All the people of the land of Egypt. Now, here's the bad news. That means all Egyptians and all Israelites. I am coming to bring my judgment. Because when he brings his judgment down, it is not I give judgment to you and I don't give judgment to you. His judgment comes down on everyone. And so how does Israel avoid the judgment of God and God's destruction of their firstborn? He says, slaughter a lamb. My judgment symbolically will go down on that lamb. You put the blood on your door, and when the angel of death comes, he will pass over. And the Egyptians will not have their blood on that door. And through my judgment on Egypt, you will be delivered from slavery. 
This is what happens. That's to God's past salvation. So what is it for us? How do we as sing Psalm 98 looking back to a past salvation while looking to a future judgment? We look past back to when we were set free from enslavement to sin. And yet our freedom, like the Israelites, our freedom and our salvation also came with judgment. Because God said, my judgment is coming. And yet I will, he so longs to be loving. He so longs not to forsake us. He says, you who are sinners, I will provide you a lamb. But not an actual lamb. But actual a person, Jesus himself. You see, the gospel of the incarnation is that God himself said, I so long not to forsake these people, that I, the king will come and he will say, I will pour judgment down upon myself so that you might be saved. And God in Jesus, what he did is he comes and Jesus is called the curse. He is cursed. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, it says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us. He who is the incarnation of the glory of God became the very incarnation of God's divine curse. He was forsaken so that you would never be forsaken. He was cursed so that you would receive nothing but blessings. You know what he experienced on the cross? You know, kids, you're not allowed to say this word, right? What's one of the first four-letter words you're told not to say? Damn. Damnation. Because it's a word of cursing on other people. And so what God said to Jesus on the cross, God literally said, God damn you to Jesus. I curse you, my son. So that he can look at us and he can say, my son, I bless you. I will turn my face away from him so that I may turn my face towards you. And the good news of Christianity is not Jesus came to be a great example so you and I can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and suddenly go, what can we do to avoid judgment? Because we can't. We can't. And if you try to do so, if Christmas is nothing but, hey, get ready for Christmas, don't be naughty or nice, that will destroy you. I love how Garrison Keillor calls his churches in his uh, mythical city, Lake Wobegon, One of the churches is called Our Lady of Perpetual Responsibility. (laughs) That's so great. So do you want to worship at the altar of perpetual responsibility? You see, so many of you, this is your Christianity. I'm responsible, I'm responsible, I'm responsible. And you know what? You are responsible. You and I, we screwed up this world with our injustice, our apathy to injustice. We have messed it up. And yet Jesus comes and says, I will take the responsibility so that we might be the church of grace. But Jesus says, when I have come to get rid of the curse, but I replace it with blessing, and so Jesus removes the curse from us and swaps the curse with his blessings. So let me ask you this. How might, this is how we get hope. You have hope. And so how, how, do we, how do we live into that? We've done a lot of thinking this morning because that's what we do here. We preach for 35 minutes and hope a lot of thinking will have changed you. And, but we've got to move on from simply thinking. We've got to enact this. The message of Advent is the king has come, he's broken in, and that the results of the curse, what he is doing in, in the first Advent, is slowly rolling back the results of the curse. And Jesus makes it clear that he came in the world not simply to seek and save the lost, and that's part of rolling back the curse, but he also came to search and destroy the devil. This is why Jesus comes and does things like healing people physically, You know, why didn't Jesus just kind of say, you're saved, you're saved, your spirit is saved, your soul is saved? No, he actually comes and actually physically heals people because he's not simply rolling back the curse of the spiritual problems, but the physical problems. And he also goes and he casts out demons because he's removing sin and evil from the world. And so he says, listen, I'm going to roll back the curse. And so we have the joy of knowing how the story ends, that ultimately all places where cursing is in this world, blessing will come. And joy comes by living into and enacting the hope of what is to come. That means you take up. Here's what it means. If I could say it this way, two different ways. One, it means you would enact the hope of what we have in the future by bringing blessing to places of cursing. This is, I think it is such a good thing 
that Christians, we get off our high horses and we get off our chairs and we go and work at soup kitchens at Christmas time. Now, we should do it all year long. But there is something poetic about that. Because what, what we have, the, the means by which you live into and enact the hope that we have and begin to hopefully begin to experience more joy is that you go to the places of darkness and brokenness and curse and say, I want to bring God bl- God's blessings here. God's blessings here. So you, what does it say? Enjoy to the world. No more let sin and sorrow grow, grow or thorns infest the ground. So kill sin because sin is the bringer of the curse. Seek to remove sin and suffering. Remove suffering because it is the foreshadowing of the blessings to come. There was a pastor in our denomination a number of years ago. If you remember in, what was it, 2004, when New Orleans was, was hit by Katrina, a guy named Ray Kanata. He was Princeton graduate, and he decided that he was going to take his deep and significant education from an Ivy League school, and he was going to go take over a church of about 70 people in New Orleans. He arrived in New Orleans the week before Katrina hit. In the days after Katrina hit, only 17 of his church remained. Everybody else had left the city. And so there he stood at a devastated with church that was about 17 people. And my concern for, for so many of us is that we don't respond like he does. It, and God knows, I have pushed counseling at this church and therapy. And if you have depression, I want you to deal with it in multiple different ways. But we have lost some of the simple means of dealing with depression and sadness and sorrow, which is to get your butt moving and to think about the hope that is coming and enact the hope that you have. And so you know what he did? He, you know, what, it, what, it, what they could have done is this. He could have said, you know what, this is a hurting city and I have a hurting church and so we're just going to hunker down and I'm going to shepherd these 17 people. I'm going to shepherd them and therapize them and counsel them and we're going to open up counseling centers for all the trauma that is done and that probably needed to be done. But here's what he said. That they, he said, we're going to do two things. We are going to rebuild homes, and we're going to do block parties. And that's all, oh, besides worship on Sundays. We're rebuilding homes, and we're doing block parties. Because we are God's people, and where cursing has entered this land, we will bring blessing. And we will bring Redemption. And then we're going to get together in a place where we're all looking at our wounds and we're sad and we're sorrowful. And there's many reasons for us to weep and cry and be sorrowful at the destruction around us. But we're just going to give, we're going to go to the cities and the destructive neighborhoods and we're going to have a party at the end of the week. And so we're going to build houses during the middle of the week. And over the course of the next 18 months, this church rebuilt 300 homes and had parties every weekend. Two things. They brought redemption and they brought partying. And so, might I say, could we do that? Could you get busy seeking to bring blessing where there is currently cursing? And second, may I also call you to enact your hope in this. Practice the enjoyment of your future blessings. And when the king is done, and all is made right, and all sin and evil is removed from this world... And he has made known to you your sin and then said you are redeemed and you are not forsaken and you are loved. What's the next thing he's going to do? He's going to invite you to a table. You know, redeem and party. And he's going to say, this is the table of my blessing. Come and celebrate fall of eternity. And so, brothers and sisters, I invite you to the table. I invite you to the place where you can taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that um, we get not one, but we get two physical signs that you have not left us. We got to put water on a child that reminded us of who we are. And now, Lord, we get to remember what it costs to make us yours. And we get to remember the party that is ahead for us. And so, Heavenly Father, I I set aside the simple cup and the simple bread that we're going to partake in. And I plead for your Holy Spirit to come down and set fire to the truths that we've talked about. Lord, we've looked at the hope. And so, Lord, now we need your Spirit to come and settle over that hope and give us joy. Would that be the direction of your grace this morning? Joy, joy, joy. Would you do that? In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Understand this, that we receive this cup and this bread by faith. By faith. If you are still looking for a king of this world, that will disappoint you, and this is not the table for you. If you are looking to yourself as the king of your world, your little life, to save your life, this is not the table for you. This is the table for those who come into this place and gone, I stink as the king. Everybody, all the other politicians, they stink as kings too. There is one king I have hope in. And if that is where your hope lies, I invite you to come and partake. There's a little cup somewhere near your seat. Oh, goodness. You get sloppy at parties. Uh, you'll have the top part has a little foil as the bread, and we're going to take the bread first. And then the top bottom is the juice. The night before Jesus died, he was up in, at uh, supper with his, uh, his uh, disciples and said this. He gave thanks for the bread, and he broke it right in front of them and said, This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. So all of you, if he is your king, then take and eat. Hebrews, it says, without the shedding of blood, in other words, without judgment, there is no forgiveness of sins. But praise be to God, your judgment and mine fell upon his son. So this is the cup of the new covenant. It's a new covenant, not the old, the new, and he invites you to the new covenant in which the only requirement is faith. And in which all the cursings have been taken by Jesus and nothing is left for you but the blessings. So take the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you. Drink, brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Oh God, would you turn a year of mourning into rejoicing? And Lord, where we continue to experience sorrow and suffering in this place, root us deeply in the coming judgment. Where for those who trust in Jesus, the judgment of God over us will be, Well done, my good and faithful servant. For upon our record, is the perfect works of Jesus. May we hope in that and praise his glorious name. Let's stand and sing together.